So we've got our ESXi host communicating to our NetApp and we've carved up a lung and we've presented it to this server. First thing we do is run a performance test. Now we're gonna use IO meter and if we look at what we're gonna set up. So how are we gonna set this up? We're gonna set this up with a 250, 250 kilobyte block, 100% sequential and 100% read. And we've kept this sample to less than 10 gig. There's a reason why we've done this. Because we're doing 100% reads and they're all sequential on less than a 20 gig disk, the NetApp is gonna serve all those IOP requests from its cache memory because it's got enough cache RAM to cover those reads. This means we're gonna be stress testing our ESXi host and the network connection without having to worry about whether the NetApp has enough disks and capability to stress test the connections correctly. This is what we call a cache run. Now we deliberately chosen large block sizes because we want to test the capacity of our network link. And we know that the larger the block size, the faster the transfer rate. Now we can see from this test that we're getting around about 470 IOPS. But more importantly, we can see that the total megabytes per second is 120 M. BPS, and this is significant. We've created one gigabit connection from the ESXi host back to the switch. If we do the conversion, one gigabit equals approximately 125 megabytes. Now, taking into account that there's gonna be some overhead for iSCSI and packet headers and that, we can see that we're very close to that limit. And we have to ask the question, is the network restricting the amount of IOPS that the SAN could produce? Now it could be that the NetApp is just not capable of serving IOPS fast enough to exceed the 125 megabytes per second that the gigabit connection can handle. The next stage is to have a look in the performance stats to see how much the network card is getting utilized. The next stage is to have a look and find out which NIT is serving the iSCSI data. So we see the iSCSI kernel here and it's using NIC 6. Right, we can see that the use of the NIC has significantly increased as we have started running the IOP test. And if we look down in the statistics here, we have a look down here, we can see that the latest as it's running at the moment is around about 120 megabytes per second. And it's very possible that we are saturating that one gigabit connection. Furthermore, it's not great having just one NIC connection to handle all our iSCSI traffic. There's no level of redundancy. So what we're gonna do now is add another NIC to handle iSCSI traffic and load balance between both those NICs. And that's called round robbing. Right, so to do this, we need to go back into our network setup. What we're gonna do is add another NIC to this VM kernel. Now I should state that this procedure we're gonna carry out now is designed for ESX i5 and above. Before five, you had to use command line and I would, if you're still using that version, I would Google how to carry out this procedure. So under properties and network adapters, we're gonna add another network adapter. I'm gonna add number seven. Now you'll notice when I go into the VN kernel that we're now getting this explanation mark. If we look at this, it basically is telling us that we can't as just simply associate two NICs with one VM kernel. It's not capable of working in, in such a way. So the first thing we need to do is with this V kernel connection here is remove one of those adapters. We go in here, we can see the IP address that we set up earlier. And if we come under teaming, we can see that it's got two active adapters. That's not what we want. We need to make sure that this tick box here is selected and take the new NIC that we've created and move this down to unused adapters. Uh, as a warning, it's gonna interrupt the iSCSI traffic for a moment. The warning's now gone. We can check that we can see our IO meter is still running. It's still 120 megabits per second. Nothing has changed at all. Next stage is to add a new VM kernel. So 
we take the properties, we add, we select VM kernel. And we need to enter a IP address. Now this has to be on the same subnet and same VLAN if we're using VLANs as the NetApp iSCSI and the uh, ESXi iSCSI connection. Now we go back into here again, we can see that explanation mark. So we need to go for the new VM kernel we've created, edit it, override and move the opposite network card. So in this case, it's six down to unused adapters. Now, if we'd added another adapter on here, so we've now got three VM NICs, we need to make sure for each VM kernel, there is only one active adapter. So we would move all the adapters down into unused. So we now have two VM kernels with different IP addresses. We have two physical NICs all connected to our iSCSI network. And we can see this is represented here with the different IP addresses and the different NICs. Now we go back to our IO test and we can see that we are still only getting 114 to 120 megabits per second. So let's go back and look at our performance chart. So we do have two NICs, but we can see that this one is not being used at all. So everything is still getting utilized on NIC 6. And that's because we now have to tell each of the data stores that we want to load balance across two NICs. To do this, we find our data stores. And we take the NetApp LUN and hit properties. Now we're looking at this managing paths. So each SCSI, iSCSI connection back to the NetApp from the ESXi host to the NetApp via the switch is called a path. Now we can see this has now got two active paths. Now we need to make sure that this is set to round robbing. Hit change, and hit close. And we do this for our other lung we've created. Now often this will not default to round robbing and it will be marked as fixed. So in this instance, we've not had to change it, but often you will have to. So now we can go back and look at our IO test. And we can see it's now increased to 129. Now that's higher than the theoretical maximum limit of a single network connection. So we can see now it is clearly using the two network connections. And before it was that network connection that was limiting the overall performance. Now if we go and look at the performance graphs, we can now see that both NIC 6 and 7 have data going through them and they're approximately half what they had before. And as you can see on the graph here, it's gone all the way from up there down to here when we stopped and here where we now joined the two NICs together. This is probably it's now sharing load equally between each of those connections. What we can also demonstrate is how this works in the event of a failure. So if we now go back and have a look at our storage we can see that it's telling us that there's two active paths, two ways to this data. And indeed, in the standard screen, it tells you the number of paths and how many are broken. What we do is we're gonna effectively kill the connection to one of those NICs. So we look back onto our switch, and if we look at our port configuration, we have 
NIC 6 and 7 both up and running. Now we can also see here that we're utilizing those ports 70, uh, sorry, 55 and 43. So it's not exactly 50-50 um, split, but we can see that, that both are being used. So we can take one of these offline, we're going to take six offline. Okay, we can see this is now disabled. If we return back to the server and have a look at the path, we can see one of those paths is now dead, so there's only one that is active. If we go and have a look at the performance stats, we will see that NIC6 has dropped right off, but NIC7 has now returned back up to where it was before at full capacity. And we have a look at our IOPS. And if we have a look back at our IO meter, we can see that the total transfer rate has dropped below the theoretical maximum of a one gigabit connection. So the good news here is that there's been no interruption to service for our users. The bad side is we're now completely saturating that one connection. With proper monitoring and alerting, we will then be notified that we've lost one of our connections and can investigate why. We can re-enable that port. And within a few moments, we will see this pick up. Go back, we can have a look, we can confirm under the storage. That both, part, both paths are back and restored. Look back under the performance, and we should see that NIC7 has now returned back down, and next, next, NIC6 has returned back up. And we return back to our IOPS. As you can see, as we've now added that extra path, we can see that their IOPS have considerably increased. So it's quite clear that that one gigabit connection was a bottleneck and was being completely saturated. Now, we, as I said, we can add as many paths as we want. Now, rec we recommend in the scenario here where we will have two switches to provide redundancy in the event of a switch failure, that I would have a minimum of two paths for each ESXi host to each switch. So a total of four paths. And as I switch to one of my production systems, we can see here, by standard, we would have the four paths that I was talking about. And this will be two paths to each of the switches. I'm James Sillett, and I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you have any comments or questions, you can contact me by any of the means shown below.